Good morning, everyone. Um, so we get, we're running a, a little bit late, so we'll get going straight away with the first panel, which is on textual studies. Uh, each panelist has got about half an hour, uh, and there's going to be questions at the end of each paper. Uh, so hopefully they won't completely fill up the half hour with each slot. And we're going to start with Paul Dundas from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, there's a handout that goes with his paper, so I hope you've all got a copy of that. And he's going to talk about Tantra without Tantrism, the quotidian Jain mantra according to Somasena Bhattaraka. Well, uh, may I wish you all a, a good morning. I'm rather shaken by the news about Lance Cousins that uh, Peter's just uh, relayed. Um, anyway, I'd like to thank Peter for organizing uh, what has become an institution in China studies in recent years. And I'd also like to thank Jane Savory for all the uh, work she's put in the background. Uh, a handout is now circulating which will uh, show that the meager abstract, which is in the online in the program book, it was online originally, now it's in the program book, um, only relates tangentially uh, to what I'll be talking about this morning. Uh, I've changed the topic, my idea for a topic, at least twice since November. I was originally projecting talking about uh, divination, and I thought better about that uh, in the new year. Uh, so the handout will make clear uh, as I go through it what I'm going to be talking about, but uh, the overall presentation will take its cue from the 17th century Digambra uh, Somasena Bhattaraka, who I'll refer to just in a moment. This uh, presentation is um, a combination of specifics and some general musings, as it were, and I'd like to start by referring to John Court's pioneering paper on medieval giant goddess traditions, which was written in 1987, it just seems the other day, to be honest to me, I can remember read it quite clearly, the sensation of reading it at the time. John uh, convincingly suggests in this paper that Tantra never became a central religious idiom in Jainism, owing to the fact that the tradition could not entertain the possibility of a leap soteriology, as opposed to step-by-step -step progress to deliverance, with liberation being viewed by Jain teachings as a path, or at least the end product of a path and not a single saving event. I would not dissent from this view. Um, indeed, I can hardly imagine it being better put. But I would amplify it by pointing out some further areas uh, which differentiate Jain Tantra without actually defining Tantra at this stage from its Hindu and Buddhist equivalents. Firstly, I would suggest that Jainism has always eschewed, has always rejected the possibility of any initiatory ritual which transcends or undercuts renunciatory diksha. So while there may be quasi-initiatory um, uh, rituals in the Suri Mantra literature, they are not regarded as in any way uh, subverting uh, renunciation, uh, subverting diksha. Secondly, there exists no body of Jain texts functioning as an alternative or esoteric revelation fitted out with systematic exegesis equivalent to what can be found in Hinduism or Buddhism. Uh, there is a resilient tradition the Jain Mantra Shastra has its origins in the Purva texts, but as we all know, these texts are lost if indeed they actually existed. One may note in passing here that among the variety of meanings assigned to the word Tantra in Hemachandra's Sanskrit dictionary, the Abhidhana Chintamani, not one of these definitions he gives corresponds to text, whether ritual or otherwise. And thirdly, I would point out that while it's clear that some giant tantric texts do describe rituals by which powers akin to omniscience can be obtained and the practitioner made temporarily the equivalent of an omniscient kavalin, revealingly, there does not exist, at least to my knowledge, any giant tantric text purporting to effect some sort of speeded up ritual transformation 
whereby the identity of a jinnah can be assumed. On that basis, I want to follow on from John's observation about the lack of overt soteriolo soteriological implications of Tantra and Jainism and say something about what be, might be regarded as one of its potentially perplexing aspects, uh, namely the Shatkarmani, the six ritual actions, and the difficulties which this phenomenon has caused for some medieval and modern Jain scholars. I commence by adducing evidence from the Trivernika Chara, uh, which can be approximately translated as the appropriate behavior of the three Jain classes. This is the last significant pre-modern Shravakachara, or description of idealized Jain social behavior. The work was written at the beginning of the 17th century in Gwalior by Digambara Bhattaraka of Karanja uh, called Somasena. I've seen the, in Karanja, I've seen uh, what I could identify as the autograph manuscript of this text. Um, and uh, Somasena describes how he, uh, although he's based in Karanja, he actually wrote the text in Gopala Chala, that is Gwalior. Further information about uh, Somasena Bhattaraka can be gained from my paper uh, listed in the bibliography. As with many other Shravakacharas, Somasena structures his work around a description of the typical ritual day for the lay Jain. He starts his account with the awakening layman being enjoined to engage in dhyana, in meditation, whose characteristics, Somasena specifies, can be understood from Shubhachandra's 11th century Nyanarnava a work we'll hear more about today. So this is Somasena's source for meditation. He describes how negative fixations are to be abandoned by the layman as he awakes and he should develop the positive dispositions <coughs> which are appropriate to the giant life. Somasena then proceeds to subsume meditation under the heading of the Avashika Samayaka which he defines as a kind of general equanimity, which we all know. He then goes on to say that if the layman cannot engage in samayaka at the beginning of the morning, he should engage in a contemplative regime of recitation of mantras, which Somasena refers to as the most appropriate form of practice in the Kali Yuga, in the uh, world age in which we're living. He then gives a list of mantras of various lengths, large scale and small scale, paying homage to the Parameshtans, the central authority figures in Jainism. <clears throat> and then he moves on, rather disconcertingly, to a discussion of the Shat Kirmani. Now here I would draw your attention to the uh, handout and I'll be uh, 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 talking to uh, the material there over the next few minutes. <clears throat> this is section one of the handout, and I'm drawing on verses uh, 90 to 110 from the Triverni uh, Trivernika Chara. The Shatkarmani are uh, well documented in tantric literature of all sorts, Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain. Uh, the six magic actions are here presented as eight, so the term Shatkarmani is a kind of gen generic one. Uh, the uh, benign shantika and paustika um, actions supplement a core list of six. So you can see them uh, as they're laid out there. Um, uh, vashya overpowering, uh, krishti attracting, stamba immobilizing. And then the fourth one, uh, which is called by Somasena uh, nisheda, the forbidden action, which is the equivalent of elsewhere marana, killing or elimination, then Vidwesha, bringing about hatred, Uchata, driving away by magic, uh, Shanti, and Paustika. And the structure that Soma Sena gives in the Trivernika Chara is similar to one in an earlier Digambara Tantric text, uh, the 11th century Bhairava Padmavati Kalpa of Malashena Suri, which uh, Alexis Sanderson mentioned last night. Soma Sena, uh, proceeds to describe the ritual involved in the performance of the Shatkarmani, uh, the mandala associated with each action, the direction associated with each action, the seed syllables associated with, action, with each action, the <coughs> colors associated with each action, and so on. With reference to colors, I'll be 
referring to just in passing in a moment, but a, a very detailed treatment of this is given by Ellen Goff in a very important paper which I've listed on the bibliography um, uh, about uh, entitled Shades of Enlightenment. So Soma Sena gives a, 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 a ritual uh, uh, for each of these actions. And he then provides a list of eight mantras, which I've included uh, on the handout, which you can see there. And he, in fact, starts out with uh, a, a mantra for those aspiring to gain liberation, which is basically the Pancha Namaskara mantra in Sanskrit uh, with bija syllables and the word partika or patikebyo um, uh, substituted for the more normal upajaya. Then we have a ritual for Homa, uh, a mantra for Homa ritual. And then we are given a succession of uh, rituals for the, uh, of mantras for the, uh, the various uh, uh, of the six magic acts, ending up with what he in fact calls a mantra for marana, for killing. He uses the term. He's avoided it before, but now he, uh, he's used the term nisheda before, but now he uses the actual term marana. And the mantra I've highlighted in black, and it ends with the bija syllables ge, ge, and it's in, uh, homage to the urhats. So Masena then goes on to give a brief typology of mantras in verse 1, 111, um, in which, as you can see, he uh, identifies three types of mantra and three places where the mantra can be performed. And he says that a mantra aimed at an evil result should be recited in the funeral ground. He then gives a verse, this is 113, uh, in which he uh, provides what you might call a metaphorical interpretation of the six, six magic acts in which they are um, interpreted in um, a doctrinal way. So, for example, <clears throat> uchatana, um, which means driving away by magic power, driving away enemies, is described as uh, meaning dispelling dangers arising from the four main states of rebirth. And instead of including marana, or the forbidden act, <coughs> Somasena includes, in fact, mohana instead. And mohana is described, I've picked it out in black, as daily confusing confusion. Now, leaving aside the noteworthy fact that Somasena's a uh, fairly lengthy discussion uh, locates mantric practice and meditative activity at the very beginning of the ritual day. These topics are usually postponed in Shravagacharas. Somasena starts off with, uh, with these. It would be reasonable to conclude from this evidence that he evinces a certain degree of ambivalence about the nature and status of the Shakurmani, and in particular, this highly controversial one of Marana, of killing, of destruction, which is both there and not there. He names the mantra as the Marana mantra, but then he, he leaves it out of his metaphorical typology, uh, his, his metaphorical interpretation of uh, the Shatkarmani, but he also refers to the funeral ground as a place where one should perform rituals which have an evil outcome. There's a degree of ambivalence here, and I want to amplify this over the next few minutes by reference to some Shwetambara texts. So if you look at section two, I've given a brief quotation from Hemachandra's Yoga Shastra. Again, we heard about Hemachandra's Yoga Shastra last night from Alexis. Hemachandra deals very cursorily with the Shatkarmani, the six uh, magic actions, and he gives what one might regard as uh, a standard explanation uh, uh, when he deals with um, the equivalent of marana, because he doesn't actually name it. He says that this action involves destruction of karma. So it involves a type of destruction, but it's destruction of karma. And you should meditate on the white color of ong. I'm drawing on Uli Karnstrom's translation here. Jayet karmaghate shashi prabham. But if you want another uh, cursory um, uh, account of marana, then in section three, I've given a quotation from Singhatilika Suri's uh, mantra Raja Rahasya, 
which was written after the Yoga Shastra, an extremely influential text in the Jain Tantric tradition, a uh, little studied so far, although there's a perfectly serviceable edition by Jaya listed on the handout, as the sources I refer, refer to are all listed. This, in this text, he gives a highly condensed description of the Shakramani, as I say. He gives, for example, an account of how one wins women through uh, the Akrishti uh, 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 ritual of the Shakramani, and also how one can bring death to an enemy. <clears throat> and I've given the, uh, uh, the Sanskrit there without uh, translating it. Uh, l l the end, it says, Shatra or Dhruva Mrityu, if you meditate on this mantra, which is black colored, and not white, as Hemachandra said earlier, for the equivalent one, uh, then there is Shatra or Dhruva Mrityu. Certainly there comes about death for an enemy. So two slightly conflicting uh, interpretations uh, of uh, the Marana action. And moving on uh, into section uh, 4.1, I here adduce evidence from a teacher who is uh, mysterious to me um, in terms of chronology, uh, Badragupta Charya, who uh, may have lived in the 14th or 15th century. Uh, he, uh, several occasions in what I've read by him, uh, invokes Kalikunda Nata, uh, who is a version of Parshwa, uh, at the shrine of Kalikunda, which is mentioned in Jinnah Prabhasuri's Vivida Tirtha Kalpa. Perhaps Steve Ose might throw some light on this, uh, on this uh, uh, particular shrine. I don't know much about it, to be honest. Um, and this may be some collateral way of, of, of dating uh, Bhadragupta Charya. Uh, at any rate, his Anubhava Siddha Mantra Dwatrinshika, 32 verses on mantras mastered through practice, is in fact a kind of uh, textbook about the performance of the Shatkarmani, the six magic rituals. It's not actually 32 verses, that's just a, 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 a title that's meant to be reminiscent of Siddhasena uh, uh, Devakara's famous Dwatrinshika text. So it's in fact in five chapters and it's about uh, uh, 300 verses long. Uh, he describes um, a mantra which is connected with killing over the page, in fact, you can see, inflicting death. And I've highlighted the relevant bits. Here he describes the mantra as taking the form of an enemy and being mrityudam, dealing out death. <coughs> in another text by Badragupta Charya, um, the Pancha Namaskara Chakrodhara Vidhi, which is a ritual text for the performance of uh, mantric ritual largely centering around the Pancha Namaskara, um, we have rituals given for um, several of the Shatkarmani, but in the edition that I've used of this, which occurs in the, uh, the volume that will be known to some of you, Namaskar Swadhyay, um, the two uh, potential, potentially controversial um, Shatkarma, of the Shatkarmani, that is Uchatana, and marana are omitted. And there's a, a square bracket intervention, in fact, by the editors. They say, te niratikatwan na nirdishte. These two have not been described because they are, well, pointless, meaningless. In other words, the text has been censored by the editors. <clears throat> and this is uh, fairly striking if you move on with the text because they uh, the text then goes on to describe, and the editors have left it in, the actual rituals involved with Luchatana and Marana in terms of uh, how they are performed in mandalas. So there's been a degree of uh, ambivalence on the, part, on the part of editors towards um, these actions, and in particular, Marana. My final block of information comes from Manatunga Suri, um, who was perhaps writing around the 11th century. I'm not sure about this. I'm not sure whether he is or is not the author of the celebrated uh, Bhaktamara Stotra. He may be, or it may be another teacher of the same name. In his uh, Navakara Saratawana, which is a Prakrit work, uh, he uh, connects some of the Shatkarmani uh, with the Parameshtins the authority figures in Jainism, the objects of homage in the Pancha Namaskara. And as you can see from the handout, the liberated souls are regarded as bringing the universe 
into their power, so Vashikarana is treated in a doctrinal way. Confusion um, uh, is regarded as bringing about confusion for worldly things. Teachers neutralize the effects of water and fire. So in other words, this is a, a, a fairly uh, ethical and doctrinal interpretation of the Shakramani, or at least some of them. But Manatunga Suri also wrote a uh, commentary on his Navakara Saratavana, which is in Sanskrit. It's an expansion of it. It's quite a long text, and it's quite a difficult text. And this text is really quite odd if you have certain presuppositions about what Jainism ought to be about uh, and what it should not be about. And I've just given you some kind of sense of uh, um, some of the material that's in it. Um, he discusses the Shatkaramani at some length, sometimes as being curative rituals, but sometimes as really quite aggressive rituals. And here we find something which is very rare in Jainism, the use of mortuary-derived symbols and mortuary-derived symbolism. So he refers to bringing divine women into one's power through inscribing a yantra on a female skull, uh, effecting the untimely death of an enemy by inscribing a seed syllable on a human skin with a mixture of poison and blood, uh, driving away enemies located in a funeral ground by means of a ritual involving skulls. I'm just reading out what you can read on the handout. There's a lot more of this material in that text. It's a rather difficult text, in fact, I would have to say. And that might explain why the editors um, of uh, Namaskar Swadhyaya, um, the volume from which I'm taking this text, which is an extremely uh, important collection of giant mantric material uh, edited by three extremely prominent uh, Shwetambara scholar monks, <coughs> runs in tandem with a Gujarati translation. But for this text, the Gujarati translation is omitted. Um, no reference to this is made. The reason, quite simply, we're uh, it's assumed that those who read Sanskrit can read this and draw their own conclusions. So what I'm drawing attention to here is a degree of ambivalence about the Shatkaramani, uh, both historically and uh, in scholarship. The um, most recent discussion I know of the Shatkaramani uh, is to be found in Sagamal Jain's uh, Hindi uh, synopsis of Jain Tantra, uh, Jain, uh, Jain Dern or Tantric Sadhana of 1997. It's on the bibliography. Uh, which provides a largely uh, descriptive, uh, non-analytical account of an extensive repertoire of Jain mantras and yantras and mandalas and so on. It's a really very interesting book, but for those of you who know Sagarmal's scholarship, you won't be surprised to learn it has no footnotes and the referencing is uh, rather awkward at times. Uh, Sagarmal uh, reaffirms what one might call the orthodox uh, position, that the Shakramani were understood, understood uh, historically by Jains in spiritual, nonviolent terms relating to um, the attainment of liberation. And he says that the Shakramani perceived from what one might say is a generalized non-Jain perspective uh, are a kind of perverse equivalent of the six avashikas, the obligatory ritual actions which, lay, uh, which lie at the core of Jain renunciant and uh, lay disciplinary behavior. Jain monastic teachers, so Sagamal asserts, never prescribed engagement uh, with the, as it were, tantric Shakramani, always preaching against rituals such as Marna. And he says that the Shakramani entered into Jainism through blind imitation, his expression is undanukaran, of Hinduism. Uh, a fact that can be gauged uh, from the Shatkarmani mantras being framed in Sanskrit rather than Prakrit, as in fact you can see from the handout. He furthermore asserts that as a rule, mantras composed in the Jain tradition um, relating to Marana and such like are actually not found. He says, well, we've got descriptions of Marana, uh, but if you actually look around, Jain teachers never formulated mantras relating to it. Well, there's at least one mantra that I've given you on the handout, which is uh, a mantra for Marana. Sagamal's got an explanation for who was responsible for this, and this echoes what Alexis said at the end of his uh, lecture last night. The agents responsible for the appearance of the tantric Shatkarmani in Jainism are not real Jain acharyas. He takes a purist line here. They're domesticated renunciants 
And he's got a kind of rogues gallery here. Um, it's the Chaityavasans who get blamed for an awful lot of things uh, in Jainism up to about the 13th century, the domesticated temple dwelling Shwetambra ascetics. And then more recently, it's the Yatis, the kind of uh, modern uh, aliforms of, of the Chaityavasans. And then I'm sorry to say he also invokes Digambara Bhattarakas as being responsible for the perpetuation of this sort of activity, quasi-renunciant figures. And this is a kind of rerun of the uh, Enlightenment critique of the debasement of true religion by a corrupt priestly class. In concentrating on the Shakramani in this presentation I'm about to finish, um, uh, I've no intention of attempting to reveal a suppressed dark side of Jainism or to dismay those who would feel that Jain ethics insulate the tradition from any possibility of engaging in potentially frivolous or malevolent ritual practices. Rather, we might recall the observation by Hudrian in what remains the best study of the Shakramani in Hinduism and Buddhism at any rate, Hindu and Buddhist Tantra, that... Quote, the Shat Karbani system is not merely a group of cruel or magic acts, but it comprises the whole range of human effort and objectives as reflected in ritual. I would conclude ever so whimsically by suggesting that the ambivalence or reticence on the part of many medieval and modern Jain authorities about the nature of the Shat Karmani, and in particular the status of Marana, it exists and it doesn't exist. It's not really important. One can explain it away. It's perhaps analogous to the broader position of Tantra in Jainism as represented in much scholarship on the tradition. It's there, but it's not really there. There does exist something which can be called Jain Tantra, but it's not really Jain Tantrism. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about this today and possibly hearing some of these questions answered. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so next on, on the panel uh, is Jagat Ram Bhattacharya from Shanti Niketan, uh, who's going to uh, give a paper on the tantric elements in the original Prashnavyakarana, a study. Good morning. topic is tantric elements in the original Prashnavyakarana. As we know that Prashnavyakarana is known as the tenth Anga canon of Jain Shutambara texts. At the same time we know that the subject matter of Prashnavyakarana, what we have today is artificially inserted as the Prashna Vyakarana these days. The subject matter, what we read these days, that is the Asrava and Sangbara, but it is uh, considered that the original text, the Prashna Vyakarana, has been lost uh, or had been kept in unknown zone. Uh, the that is, uh, uh, in the sense of that, uh, that it should not go to wrong hand and uh, to prevent misuse of the uh, supernatural powers, uh, supernatural things, omens, and uh, these uh, materials what, what are written in the Prashna Vyakarana. Uh, fortunately, uh, I had the uh, manuscript from Nepal archives and uh, I have uh, tried to edit that uh, text and what I found I want to uh, present before you that uh, it is uh, it was lost or it was kept in dark uh, in the sense that it should not go in the wrong hand till now I don't consider myself a proper person to hold this uh, text and uh, so it is not in proper hand so I don't have any handouts. Uh, Jain scriptures are focused on different facets of spiritual practices 
though apparently it seems contradictory with each other when referred to its basic standpoint, a sociological, socio-historical study better explains how a demand arises with a phase of time and practices tend to accept foreign elements and the whole factor leaves its impression on the main theory. This particular phenomenon is evidently seen in some of the scriptures of which Prashnavyakarana is very important. The subject matter of the scriptures basically deals with ethics, epistemology, metaphysics, and cosmology. In this reference, the name Prashnavyakarana does not correspond to the scriptural phenomenon. In Indian perspective, every term or word has particular meaning. To get that meaning, three main methods are taken into consideration, such as vyutpatti, nirvachana, and lakshana. Therefore, prashna vyakarana has two words, prashna and vyakarana. This compound word has a simple meaning, that question in grammar. In this sense, a particular scripture cannot correspond to the spiritual purpose. Thus, the above said meaning leaves a scope of other options into it. Vyakarana has its different explanation that does not stand for grammar alone. Karana means sadhana, an instrument, and Vya is explanation or elucidation. Now, prashna stands for question, but here it is related to the word Vyakarana, and after this, prashna holds another meaning when relatively applied. And that meaning is where prashna is the instrument of explanation or exposition. This meaning seems to be more significant in reference to spirituality, in reference to tantra. In the first <coughs> chapter, it is Vargarachana, the verse number three, an exposition on the word prashna has been given by raising a question, kim tadaha. The answer has been given, it is written in Prakrit, madimaham uppadam bhuanabhantara pavanta bhavarang adisha punnang nanang panhang jina payadang vachang. This is again to be described as Jina Prakrita, the exposition of Jiva Bhogin. Jiva Bhogin is the commentator of this text. Goes thus, the activities, those are going on within the three worlds, including Devaloka and Patala Loka, are subject to excessive virtue. The knowledge of these activities is the source of excellence in the intelligence, and that is to be called Prashna in other way, which is to be called in the name of Jina Prakrita. So this verse clearly says about the subject matter of the scripture when explaining Prashna. Again, the virtuous knowledge is being explained thus, Dikkala Putikanga Vidyang Tarka Angsakadham Anjaladinam, etc. Here, Putikanga Vidya means the enveloped past knowledge of directions or dimensions in time. Then tarka, angsakadvam <clears throat> anjaladinam, gyanam, means forming the past or past of debate as the resource of well-being and the knowledge of that. Thus here knowledge means the erudition which is the past of hindered activities in reference to direction and the time frame, and also the resource of imparted debate or logic meant for the state of wellness. That is here meant as excessive virtuous in keeping with the tradition. This scripture has described Anubandha Chatushtaya in the beginning of the work, along with the benedictory verse. So, with explanation of prashna, the subject matter or bishaya has been mentioned, which is one of the fourfold anubandhas. <clears throat> 
though the present text has been written or compiled by an acharya who is undoubtedly belong who undoubtedly belonged to the digambara sect and he composed the main treatise in shaurashani prakrit but the reference of a prashna is rarely seen in the original digambara texts most importantly the meaning of a prashna is completely different and it does not even correspond to the scripture in this respect shwetambara texts make the sense of prashna as it is presented in the manuscript the shwetambara text goes thus tatrangushta bahu prashnadika mantra vidyaha prashna it is in samavayanga commentary here it means that mantra vidya which kal which can tell the merits and demerits after the study of one's thumbs and arms on the other hand saptabhangi tarangini which is one of the digambara texts describes prashna as prashnika nishtha jigyasa pratipadakam vakyam hi prashna ityuchyate that sentence which corroborates the queries as it emerges in the mind of the person who puts the query prashna also represents the meaning of a problem as it is seen in dhavala all the swetambara canons are commonly acknowledged by the digambara sect so being one of these canons prashna vyakarana is also equally counted by the digambara so digambara have referred this as the 10th book of the 12 fold angas this much mention has been found in shruta gyana where as in nandi the passage goes on the introduction to the prashna vyakarana das panna vagaraneshu hnam athuttaram pasina sayam athuttara apasina sayam athuttaram pasina pasina sayam annicha vichitta dibba bijja saya naga subarnehin dibba samavaya agavijjan agavijjanti senam agavittaye dasame ange sankhe janam paya sahasayin paya genam etc here the subject matter of the text prashna vyakarana has been described it says in prashna vyakarana 108 fold each prashna a prashna and prashna prashna and many more varieties of divine erudicians of excellence with with serpentines and supernadities the divine dialogues between each other and uh, that is the tenth out of angas which has been of a volume of thousands of padas in this verse the candidature of a person who asks a question has been mentioned here it is stated that annang pannhang tu bhas manushya and anyad grahane na suswagatad anantaram pricchakacharya vastu sangsuchaka vachanam parigrihyate the whole passage is concentrated on the meaning of anya here anya means ignorant women and children therefore prashna is considered to be those statements which are raised by the ignorant women and children this verse corresponds to well uh, with the bhagavati aradhana where it goes thus i am just skipping the text the meaning is that a niryapakacharya in his research after asking or inquiring chaitya muni aryaka shravaka bala madhyama and vridha this is told in some different context which is again related with the subject of prashna here it is told in the context of defining a prashna kusala sadhu an expert ascetic asking about other queries what is more important here to mention that what kind of prashna has been meant here the answer is found in the context of niryapaka niryapaka is stated to be that acharya or a competent mendicant who help in performing vows taken by renouncer especially when in sanlekhana niryapaka can help an advancement of spirituality by holding others righteousness in right spirit and thus helps in self purification as also swetambara tradition vyavahara bhashya goes on the definition of niryapaka thus padopagame ingeni duvidha khalu hanti aya nijja vagga nijja vana ya parena ya bhatta parinaya buddhabba 
The definition refers to the context of different fashions of accepting death with righteous purpose. The meaning is that uh, that sage who has expertise in purification, especially through the phase of observing vow, of accepting righteous death with fasting, etc., and penance. So this is the quality of a prasna kusala sadhu. It is now clear that what is a prasna and who is the competent person of putting a prasna or query. Here it is very important to understand the significance of prasna in reference to prasna vyakarana. In the verse number three, two more anubandhas have been discussed, such as sambandha and prayojana. There is a term, jina payadam, mentioned in this verse. In, this, in its explanation, Jiva Bhogin named Kevali Nama Maharshi. This has a special reference in this scripture. All other Anga canons are delineated by the Ganadharas, but Prashna Vyakarana is the only Anga canon which was depicted by a Kevalin. This is a significant difference of the source of compilation of the 12 fold canons. So it is related to the Kevalin and omniscient in respect to the source of knowledge that which is counted to be the Vishaya as per prior discussion. Therefore, Sambandha is found to be in, the, uh, to be in between the source, the knowledge of Kevalin and the Vishaya. Another point may be mentioned here that uh, whatever means are used in the above practice, uh, but the mind is the essential medium of producing the answer for which a prashna was put. That is why nimitti, uh, I just uh, point out the name of naimittika or nimittaka uh, on that uh, part, uh, this portion I'm just dealing out. But the mind is the essential medium of, uh, medium of producing the answer for which a prashna was put. That is why nimitti represents the meaning of matiman and buddhiman, etc. The mentions of sthita viparitam aditya bhrantim cha gyatva and uh, pratak shareshu pachakka bakya shareshu va are the instances of special kind of calculations. Actually, in the tradition of nimitta jnana and naimittika, etc., discussed under supernatural activities. Eight types of nimitta jnanas are mentioned here. The person who practices is called naimittika. Dussudang cheva dudittang aggahetung sadabhave sadittang sasudang cheva gahidabbang kamenadu. The merits and demerits of the prashna has been described when discussing the candidate with honest purpose and with the righteous purpose as a prashnak, prashnakarta. Among them, the person who puts question with righteous purpose should not be entertained. With unrighteous purpose should not be entertained. He should not be counted to be a competent candidate for asking question. The ignorable demerits and the useful merits of a naimittika are the main object of verse number seven and eight. Ka mangala namakkara tam manota parayano ananna manaso cheva abagga parikamasu. Suparikhida disa bhao disa desa gadimya chinta bang sabba kajesu majhatena manena ya. Among the ignorable parts, it is told that to be a naimittika, one should not be inclined to the other school and practices. So a term, ananna manasa, has been used in the same meaning. Jiva Bhogin has explained it in this manner. Nanesu sastresu manasa sakting kuryat. The answer is thus, yasmad itesu cha karmasu asaktasya na sastre samyak jnadesa sputa naivang syadati. Means it is not possible to have a clear vision and right knowledge in the scripture if one has interest in other scriptures which are meant to be the other schools or practices. 
Then a question has been raised in the explanation. Kidri Sastra Shau Naimit Tika Bhavati. Now in terms of defining the eligibility, which makes one Naimit Tika. The verse number eight goes thus, that person who puts his thought with indifferent mindfulness in the particulars of the direction and the symptoms, the activities taking place and things and their situation and the symbols and signs and the person who <coughs> ask the question in all these things which is meant to produce the result. Again, raising question why the term madhyasthena has been used here. The answer is that indifferent mindfulness, the expected outcome is possible to forecast. Not only that, the probable cause of violation or vitiation in difference is also mentioned in the exposition. It is said, Natu ragadina dhishtena desha karyaha. When forecasting or delineating something, one should not be under control of inadvertence, attachment, or aversion. So it is not only where concentration along with indifference and expected for a naimittika. Now we see a Naimittika does not represent a simple intelligent person, but who has the knowledge or extrasensory power to forecast unseen aspects of life as it is seen in the verse number nine and in its supplements. Therefore, a Naimittika is better to define as a knower of Nimitta Sastra because without knowledge, practice is not possible. So only knowledge has been referred to here while practice is not emphasized here. So it was told in the verse number three, Madhimaham Uppada, etc., etc. Uh, now onwards, the verse put forth an account of the letters and the process of conjunction and their variety in detail. The name of the chapter is Varga Rachana. Here it comes, the subject matter of the chapter Varga Rachana, also non-conjunct letters have been discussed in the verse number 10. Now, uh, there is a, a a chart a table that is called. It is called that. Uh, uh, that all the alphabets, uh, vowels, and consonants are arranged in a system. It is called Ashtavargika and Panchavargika. Ashtavargika that eight columns and uh, five rows. Uh, here also that uh, there is the due to the Bija mantra. These uh, letters have uh, great implications. So first uh, that Vargika, Ashtavargika. It is that a, a, ka, cha, ta, ta, pa, ya, sha, etc., etc. Second is a, i, ka, cha, ta, ta, pa, ra, sha, e, o, ga, ja, da, da, ba, la, sa. Next, e, o, ga, ja, da, da, ba, wa, ha. Next, u, u, wa, ya, ra, na, ma, ang, ah, etc., etc. So, uh, uh, I am not uh, going to read out the whole text. First thing is that there are 34 chapters, uh, rather 35 chapters, uh, including the Parishishta. The first chapter is Vargarachana. There are so many things uh, that, uh, uh, although it is Prashna Vyakarana, it is said Prashna Vyakarana. So Prashna Vyakarana, it corresponds to the, uh, the, the grammar part, as well as these all alphabets, or letters, or phonemes, those who are related with the uh, Nimitta Sastra, with, uh, with with the supernatural, with the uh, aspects. And it is uh, written here also. It is very difficult to uh, bifurcate that uh, it is a grammatical part is discussed here or the Bija mantras or something like that is uh, very much uh, related to Nimitta Sastra is there. Uh, we have a very quick look of the other chapters, the matter materials of other chapters. The second chapter is Yoni Nirdesha and it is uh, the Drabbas of Dhatu, Mula and Jeevas and the category of Nashta, Musti, and Chinta, etc. And uh, in this chapter, all the sounds based on vowels and consonants are placed in numbers. The quantity of vowels is also mentioned. Uh, and there is a certain, uh, certain terminology are there which is not uh, we, we find in um, Sanskrit grammar or uh, the Paninian system. So, Lagu Akshara, Guru Akshara, and uh, Baragakshara, Tiryant Matra, Ardha matra, urdha matra, etc., etc., are discussed in the second chapter. 
Third chapter is the Shiksha Prakarana, and here it is dealt with the, the uh, articulation, the place of articulation. In, in Paninian grammar, the, the word, the sound, the place of articulation is something different, and here it is mentioned that, such as Ura, Ura means uh, from the chest, Kantya, Jiva Mulya, Talabya, and Ostha, etc. Okay, I just, five minutes, five minutes? okay, I'll finish this. The fourth chapter is Sankata Bikata. And uh, some letters are denoted as Sankata, like that vowels A, E, and the seventh A. And uh, some letters, uh, these are called Bikata. This chapter is called Sankata Bikata. Next fifth chapter is Uttaradhara. Uttaradhara, it is the description of gradually descending form of all substances and the sounds, both vowels and consonants. And uh, the terminology such as Uttara, Adhara, Laghu, Guru, Avihata, Anavihata, form of sounds, uh, these are, we can find in, in the fifth chapter. Sixth chapter is Abhighata. Abhighata is based on the sound of letters. That is Alingita, Antara Dirgha, Abhidhumita, Dagdha, Charimasara, etc. are used for these vowels and consonants. And uh, the seventh chapter, it is uh, Jiva Sangha, Bheda, and uh, there is Ashtabargika and Panchabargika, what I told now. And uh, eighth is Jiva Chinta, based on uh, that uh, bipeds, uh, quadrupeds, humans, subhumans, and gods, and especially uh, description of human characteristics with the, with the sounds and vice versa. Ninth chapter is Jiva Chinta. It is description and relation of sounds with other creatures, such as insects, birds, and animals. The tenth chapter is uh, Dhatu Chinta, and uh, this is, this is uh, of course, the metals, gold, silver, copper, lead, iron. And interestingly, that Dhatu, the metal, has the gender also. So gender, feminine gender and, and masculine gender, there are some, some, some uh, metals are there. Anyway, and Mula Sangha, the description of vegetation body, creepers, bush, and tree. And Mula Chinta is twelfth chapter, discussion on the trees and fruits. Thirteenth chapter, Mushti Gyana, it is, uh, it is um, Bija Mantra. And uh, the direct result of this Bija Mantra is discussed here. And fourteenth uh, chapter is Sankata Bikara, it is the supplement of the fourth chapter. And fifteenth chapter is Sansthana Vibhaga, it is quantity of vowels, Vritta, Dirgha, Trashra. Triasra, Chatusra, etc., etc. These are very new and we cannot find in Paninia grammar. <coughs> so, uh, and in consonants also, apart from Britta, Dirgha, Triasra, Chatusra, we find Ayata and Mishra. And uh, <coughs> there is the Varna Vibhaga, description of the colors of sounds. So, such as A, E, and A, it is a smoky blue, uh, a smoky color, and U is black, yellow, and smoky, and E is white. I is smoky blue, etc., etc. They are the, the vowels, those who have colors here. And the consonants also, the uh, colors. And then the 17th chapter is Ghana Chidra Vibhaga. It is some Ghana, some words, some phonemes, some sounds are very solid, some are flexible. And it has some subchapters, Gandha Vibhaga, Rasha Parimana, Nastika, Swagriham Kanda, etc. Jnana Kanda, that is uh, Swagyana. Uh, Swajana Parijana, that is the related uh, uh, family members and the, uh, and the outsiders and the guests and uh, happening in the house and the outside and uh, worry about uh, that uh, fear from death, etc. Uh, written here. Sankhya, the 19th chapter, sounds both vowels and consonants identified with numbers, has a specific implications in use to calculation, permutation, and combination and uh, the lifespan, it is related with the lifespan. Kala Nayana, uh, it is uh, the time, that the day, week, month, and etc., etc. Okay. <laughs> so, Nakshatra Nayana, and uh, there is uh, some uh, 34 chapters, and I have written here the uh, subject matter only, I have not discussed elaborately, and uh, it is a very Herculean task to do that, and uh, to be very frank, I am not a competent authority, I am not a um, student of Tantra, so to, to decipher all the, all the uh, subject matters is very difficult for me, and it is written in Soroshani Prakrit. The commentary is in Sanskrit mixed with Prakrit, 
So it is the very first time I am just dealing with this subject. And uh, okay, thank you. <laughs>